Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Today, uh, the National Center for Health and Public Housing will be presenting a webinar on addressing health disparities for LGBTQIA plus people and people with HIV in public housing. In today's session, we will focus on lived experiences, health disparities for LGBTQIA plus people and people living with HIV in public housing. Before we continue, this is just a kind reminder to everybody that all participants are muted upon entry. Please make sure that you engage in the chat if you would like to submit any questions, if you have any comments, if you have any promising practices from your organization that you would like to share with us today related to today's topic, you can also do that in the chat. And uh, raise your hand if you would like your line to also be unmuted. This meeting is being recorded. The slides and recording will be sent via email after today's session. Also today, we are aiming to have a conversational webinar. We're hoping that you're able to engage with the panelists that we have today. Um, so feel free to raise your hand during the presentation and your line will be unmuted. So about the National Center for Health and Public Housing, the mission of NCHPH is to strengthen the capacity of public housing primary care grantees and other health center grantees by providing training and a range of technical assistance. NCHPH is a project supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration and is also a national training and technical assistance partner that is 100% financed by this grant. The information presented today are those of the author only. Uh, this is just a brief introduction about uh, the NCHPH uh, members that will be on the line today. We have Dr. Jose Leon, who is our Chief Medical Officer, and myself. Uh, my name is Fide Pineda, and I am the TTA Manager at NCHPH, and I will be helping moderate and facilitate the webinar as we go. We also have today our guest speakers, Anthony Fortenberry, who is the Deputy Executive Director for Callen Lord, and uh, we also have Stephen Puibello, who is a consumer advocate for mental health, substance abuse, and HIV from Bipolar Bear. Mm -hmm. And this is just some information related to health centers that are close to public housing. According to 2022 UDS data, there were over 1,300 federally qualified health centers that served to 30.5 million patients. 483 of those FQHCs were in or immediately accessible to public housing, that served to 6.1 million patients, and 107 were PHPCs that served to over 900,000 patients in 2022. Okay. And here we have some public housing demographics uh, data. This data basically describes the demographics of residents of public housing. And as it is displayed, the, the 1.5 million residents that demonstrate characteristics that differentiate residents of public housing from the, from the US general population. For example, residents of public housing are 52% white, 43% African-American, 26% Latinx, 19% are elderly, and 36% and 36 are uh, children. Residents of public housing are also disproportionately from households that are low income and female headed. And now I will pass it on to our chief medical officer, Dr. Jose Leon. Thank you, Fide. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. It's yeah. such a great pleasure to be part of this conversation and have two great uh, panelists for today's webinar. Uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of the webinar, if you can either use the Q&A um, box or the chat feature to let us know uh, your name, where you are, and what organization you are with, that's going to uh, help us understand our audience and making sure we are addressing all your issues and, and questions and concerns about this topic. It's also important to say that this we are trying to make this very interactive. So please make sure that you, uh, if you have questions, uh, just use the same features, either the Q&A or the chat 
uh, features uh, to let us know your questions and anything that you would like to know from Anthony and from Stephen. So uh, just a quick introduction on, on UDS, the Uniform Data System and the numbers provided by health centers. Uh, in regards to the number of patients who are being diagnosed with HIV, and in 2022, all health centers reported almost 200,000 patients uh, who are uh, HIV positive and uh, PHPC, so public housing primary care grantees, uh, reported almost 5,000 patients uh, with HIV. Next slide, please. In, the, in regards to the quality of care measures, uh, uh, this is for all federally qualified health centers. The, uh, the last uh, number is the most important number that I would like you to pay attention to, and is the estimated percentage of patients seen within 30 days of first diagnosis of HIV, and health, uh, all health centers are reporting that uh, AO, 82% of them are, uh, are being seen by health center 30 days of first diagnosis of HIV and receiving all the health services that they need. Uh, so this is extremely important. Let's remember that uh, we cannot have a conversation about uh, ending the HIV epidemic if we do not address health disparities and health centers are positioned to help health centers, uh, I'm sorry, HIV patients, not only providing treatment or access to you know, pre-exposure prophylaxis, but also screening patients and helping patients who, who may have other social determinants of health, uh, such as housing issues or, or if they are uninsured. So this is uh, a great way to help patients and start providing health services and social services within 30 days. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So just a quick reminder about the ending the HIV epidemic by 2030. Um, what we are trying to achieve is that uh, we are trying to bring the numbers down and the percentage down by 75% in 2020 and by 90% by 2030. And uh, there are several uh, publications and resources that we can have, that we can use and making sure that we address all these issues and helping our population to achieve these, uh, these goals. Next slide, please. In regards to uh, sexual orientation data, I know that we have uh, many uh, health centers who may be public housing primary care grantees who are, who, are, uh, who are close to or immediately accessible to public housing. And these numbers uh, are provided by health centers uh, showing sexual orientation data. I'm not going to go over these numbers but what is, is really uh, important to see is that the percentages are over 100%. And uh, the reason is that health centers have different ways to identify populations. And uh, some of them are even reporting patients who are under the age of 16. And that's the reason why you see uh, the percentages not adding up. But uh, what we need to know and what is important to know is that health centers are um, getting all the form in this information and making sure that the, uh, the, the population uh, receive the information that they need if they identify their sexual orientation and the uh, gender uh, identity as well. Next slide, please. This is the gender identity uh, data provided by uh, uh, public housing primary care grantees. Uh, this is a really good way to assess the needs in the community and making sure that we develop the services for our populations or the populations that we are serving. Next slide, please. So with uh, further ado, I would like to, uh, to introduce uh, Anthony. Anthony, good afternoon. 
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining Stephen and I today to talk about, um, you know, A, how uh, discrimination impacts health outcomes, but most importantly, the patient experience of these, um, you know, discriminatory practices as well as issues with access to care. Um, a little bit about myself, and then um, I will turn it over to Stephen to introduce yourself. Um, my name is Anthony Fortenberry. I use he and him. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of Callan Lord Community Health Center in New York City. Um, Callan Lord has been around for over 50 years. We have four locations in New York City um, with services targeting the LGBTQ community. Um, about a third of our patients are of trans experience, about a quarter of our patients are living with HIV. Um, and so in today's presentation, I'm going to focus a little bit on the data that exists related to um, the experiences of the LGBTQ community in healthcare and the discrimination that exists in the community. Um, but then most importantly, we're gonna really bring in an expert today, um, Stephen Pagello, who who is a patient um, and who is going to share his lived experiences and, and the ways in which he interacts with the healthcare system. I'll turn it over to you, Stephen, to introduce yourself. Thank you, Anthony. Um, yep. So I, I use my story. My story is I diagnosed Julie with HIV and bipolar at the same time back in 1996 and um, thought I was the only, patient, only person like that because <laughs> I wasn't finding anyone. And so I took that story and I started working with the National Association on Mental Illness, writing policy with them, which was really cool. And then um, I got nominated um, and picked up uh, by SAMHSA for a fellowship. And you know, we went, what, what can I tell you? Mental, mental illness sells. <laughs> um, and, but to, to wrap it up, it's just, yeah, I take my stories, living duly diagnosed. I was mm, 34 then, I'm now 65. Medications are working, I'm aging. I'm growing older. I'm, I'm in public housing. I have the uh, safety net of housing. I'm in recovery from addiction, and housing makes that makes that happen too. And all the services I get at Count Lord, it, that also makes it happen. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. We are so grateful to Stephen um, at, in being a thought partner for how we iterate a lot of our services. Stephen's been very active in our cab and continues to be an advisor in many ways. And so, so lucky to have him. I encourage everyone to put any questions in the chat um, for Stephen. Um, I'm going to go through some slides with a ton of data, but I'm going to do it relatively quickly because I think the real um, meat of the conversation today is going to be with Stephen. And so we'll go through some slides and then we'll turn it over to a bit more of a Q&A afterward. So we can go to the next slide. Our learning objectives today are one, to understand health disparities in disease prevalence and behavioral health burden affecting the LGBTQIA plus community and people living with HIV. Understand the intersection of these disparities with racial and ethnic disparities and age cohort differences. I'm gonna do that um, in a later slide, I'm really focusing on the impact of discrimination from a population health lens. Um, and then lastly, understanding the impact of discrimination and stigma on the health and well being of these populations and their ability to access culturally responsive care. We'll also share a bit of our best practices at Callum Lord to achieve this. Next slide. So I'm gonna start with stigma and discrimination and how this impacts um, health and well being. Of course, legal discrimination and access to health insurance, employment, housing, adoption, and retirement benefits disproportionately impact the LGBTQ community and create barriers to access to care um, for a myriad of reasons. There's a lack of laws protecting against bullying in schools. In fact, our LGBTQ youth um, report higher rates of discrimination experience, particularly in um, school or in um, educational or organizations at a much higher rate than older LGBTQ adults experience. There's a lack of social programs targeted to and or appropriate for LGBTQ youth, adults, and elders. There's a shortage of healthcare providers who are knowledgeable and clinically competent in LGBTQ health. And then finally, and, and I think, you know, probably this is something that everyone is aware of. There's been so much media attention um, of late. There are over 507 anti-LGBTQ bills that have been introduced in state legislatures across the United States in the past couple of years. 
84 have been passed into law. And of these anti-LGBTQ plus bills, 136 are focused on healthcare restrictions. So this, these kinds of discriminatory, discrimination um, and discriminatory practices that are being passed through state legislatures are of course directly impacting the community. Next slide, please. A little more data, uh, more than one in three LGBTQ Americans face discrimination of some kind in the past year. And of course, this is disproportionately impacting transgender Americans. They report and more than three in five having experienced discrimination. Discrimination adversely affects the mental and economic well-being of many LGBTQ Americans, including one in two who report moderate or significant negative psychological impact. To avoid the experience of discrimination, more than half of LGBTQ Americans report hiding a personal relationship, um, and about one-fifth to one-third have altered other aspects of their personal or work lives to avoid discrimination. Um, and then lastly, LGBTQ Americans experience disproportionate mental health issues and also limited access to culturally competent mental health providers. Next slide. So access to care, about three in 10 LGBTQ Americans faced difficulties last year accessing necessarily necessary medical care due to cost. And this is true for more than half of transgender Americans. More than one in 10 LGBTQ Americans experience discrimination directly from a healthcare provider. And this disproportionately impacts transgender individuals and community of, communities of color. 15% of LGBTQ Americans report postponing or avoiding medical treatment, and 20% have avoided primary care due to experiences of discrimination. And again, our transgender populations and communities of color are disproportionately impacted by this. And I will just share from my experience at Cal and Lord, when I started at the organization um, almost 13 years ago, I started as a triage nurse. And this is, is something that our triage nurses experience a lot, patients will come in desperately in need of emergent um, healthcare services, but will refuse to go to an emergency department because of the discrimination that they've experienced there. Um, and so this is something that is still very, very true to this day. Um, transgender individuals face unique, op unique obstacles to accessing healthcare, including one in three who had to report having to need to teach their doctor about transgender individuals and transgender care in order to receive the care that they needed, which is just shocking to hear. Next slide. Um, so this is kind of the population health lens that I referred to earlier, just to kind of share a little bit, like this is very kind of high level, um, some data to demonstrate the intersectionality of how discrimination impacts um, access to care and health outcomes. So looking at youth, um, LGBT youth are two to three times more likely to attempt suicide. Um, they are also more likely to be homeless when compared to heterosexual or, or, or their uh, heterosexual or cisgender counterparts. For our transgender patients, there's a higher prevalence of HIV, of STIs, of violence and victimization, depression and suicide. Transgender patients are also less likely to have health insurance and access to care when compared to counterparts. Uh, lesbian patients are less likely to access preventative services. Gay men experience higher prevalence of HIV and other STDs, and this is especially true among communities of color. For older adults, they face additional barriers to um, accessing healthcare because of isolation. Um, and we'll talk with Stephen about um, some of that later in the, in the conversation, as well as lack, to so, lack of social services and culturally competent providers. Um, and finally, substance use, LGBT patients have a higher rates of tobacco, alcohol, and illicit substance use, you know, largely due to, um, you know, likely minority stress and other issues that, you know, kind of the health outcomes related to the discrimination and stigma experienced by the community. Next slide. Right, so what do we do about all of this? Um, I, you know, continue to feel like there is a light at the end of the tunnel and certainly having worked in this, um, uh, worked with this community in Cal and Lord for years, we have seen um, distinct improvements in access to care, um, especially in New York City. This is of course not true elsewhere around the country. Um, but really what I feel like helps is, is to start with the needs assessment. And this, you know, of course, 
um, coming from working with uh, patients like Stephen in our community advisory board and really hearing from the patient experience, what are the gaps? What can we do to improve access to care, um, even in an organization like Calamore that is focused on the LGBTQ community? Um, next is to use that data to build training and education for our providers, but not just for our clinicians. I think even more importantly, for our pharmacy staff, for our call center staff, to ensure that every touch point within the organization um, is, is going to feel you know, competent in answering questions and providing appropriate care. Um, competency evaluation is an important part of this. You know, we do not only trainings, but, but a competency evaluation from a clinical standpoint, um, but also from an operational standpoint. Next, I, I really wanted to put this in here because I feel like um, it's so important to ensure that when our patients are outside of our four walls, you know, 24 seven needs are going to arise. And of course you have your kind of after hours on call systems in place. But what, what I'm really talking about is, is collaborating with other community-based organizations that are providing all of the care that you're not providing within your four walls, whether it is a food bank or, or other um, community-based services um, related to housing, legal support, whatever it might be, these kinds of um, promoting of those organizations work, bringing those organizations in. It's a concrete example. You know, we bring in um, legal services uh, on a routine basis on site, but, but our patients are able to access those services externally too. Um, just really expanding access to support. And then finally, and you know, of course, what today's presentation is really about is centering patients and ensuring that patient voices are really informing operations and building an infrastructure to ensure that patients have an opportunity to share their ideas and their thoughts and then following up and translating those ideas and thoughts into practice change and practice improvement. And then I think importantly following up with those patients to ensure they see the impact um, of their participation. Next slide. So we're going to um, move into our kind of Q&A with Stephen. Um, a major focus, a top level, healthcare access, stigma and discrimination, and opportunities for improvement. Um, we'll hear from Stephen, his thoughts on all of these areas. Next slide. I just wanted to throw this up here, and of course, everyone will get a copy of these slides and, and um, be able to access this. But some resources, if you are um, building out or looking for technical assistance related specifically to LGBTQ healthcare, some really great resources from NAC, of course, Fenway and Whitman Walker, and then some references for all the data that I shared on the left. And so that wraps up our slides. We will um, now, I believe there's maybe one last thank you slide, uh, but we will um, turn this over to you, Stephen, um, just to kind of introduce yourself um, and tell us a little bit about your background and your history. Um, as I said earlier, I'm, 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 well, I'm Steve Trevello. I'm now, now turning 65 in less than two months. And um Looking forward to that. I never thought I'd reach 65 at one point in my life, but here I am. Um, so um, can you say that one more time, Anthony? <laughs> yeah, of course. No, just, you know, a little bit about your background um, and even your experiences uh, with Cal and Lord. Sure. So I um, duly diagnosed um, HIV positive with a bipolar disorder with several months later and um, most of my care is the behavioral health side and um, and dealing with addiction and, you know, in order to deal with being adherent to your medications and staying on track with everything, you got to deal with everything else. And so the everything else for me is uh, there's the mental health aspect and the addiction part. Um, and I, you know, I've got that, pulled that together and, and it took time after falling off many times, but over time, if you stick with it, 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 it works. And that brought me to, Callan Lord Community Advisory Board back in 2016, in my early days of early days of my recovery, um, I went I tackled it with um, community service, and so I got involved with the community uh, at, at Callan Lord where I get all my care, and um, 
started up the aging committee, started up the mental health committee, and um, it's just been a slow, if you're in a board process, it's ongoing and slow, but there's definitely traction. It's nice to see the things that you're talking about do happen over time. And so that's that's nice. That's nice to thank you for that. <laughs> and it also feels good to, to know that you're doing that. <laughs> um, as far as my health care, for myself, I count Lord. Um, I, I, uh, I, you know, the HIV care is there. Um, um, all the departments are integrated. So if you, you know, if you, if you're coming in and you're talking to your provider and your provider might be talking to you about depression, they're going to, they're going to connect you up and integrate you, get you up to the behavioral health people and, or, and, or if there's questions about, you know, anxiety and different things with your mouth, they're going to send you over to the dental department. So it's really well connected as far as in, in, uh, how everything connected. And that, and now with uh, the enhancements like the my chart and the uh, telehealth, I, I can't tell you at you know how much how it's helping me not having to commute into the city um, because I have mobility issues for my tel my teletherapy. Um, so that's that's been really since that started up out of COVID, uh, it's a good thing. I'm really happy about that. And um, just in general, there's, I just have you know great care, good experience. Um, uh, even the aging care services, I've been working on that project and. Um, there's a lot, lot, you know, there's a lot coming out now, but I'm all about Cal Lord in the year 2050. <laughs> uh, you know, the, you know, I am going to be, I'm happy to say that I am going to be living to year 2080 or 20, I'm sorry, I am going to be living to 85 years old. <laughs> What's that look like? You know, dementia, cognitive issues. Um, so I'm happy to be working on that as well. So, Thank you so I, much. So, you know, I, just, I'm sorry, I see a uh someone who would like to uh talk uh you know and and make an opinion would you like to do it now or would you would you prefer to do it sure sure yes please go ahead so Fide, can you please uh unmute uh Irena Perry me yeah sure Hi, Irina, your line has been unmuted. I didn't have a question. Thanks, it's already been answered. Okay, all right, all right. perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you would like to ask a question uh, to Anthony or Stephen, uh, you have several options. You can use the Q&A feature, the chat feature, yeah, or your line can be unmuted that you can ask your question verbally. Um, Sorry, Anthony, please go ahead. Oh, no, no worries. We, we are committed to an interactive uh, webinar today. So I encourage any questions, um, either if you want to ask um, by unmuting or to throw them in the chat. Um, you know, Stephen, you brought up our um, kind of work on expanding or improving our, expanding and improving our services for older adults. Stephen has been instrumental in providing us guidance around how to do this and like what are the gaps and how can we improve services. Um, but you know, it's interesting, uh, we also were talking about vaccination earlier and I wanna kind of turn it back to you, Stephen. You know, you talked about the importance of um, telehealth so that people, particularly with mobility issues, aren't needing to commute into the center. But you also talked about kind of the risk of isolation. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, some of your um, uh, people that you know in the housing community that maybe are at risk because of isolation. Sure. Um, you know, isolation is you, obviously, I, I don't have much family left in my life and the ones that are don't live nearby, but that's that's not isolation. That's just being, you know, you know, lack of people to talk to. Um, so I, for me, I, I'm able to, when I stay active, when I'm, um, I work part time. I use my disability. I um, one one way I I get jobs is to um, volunteer. I use the same format. Go volunteer at an agency if you just just have a disability. If you're showing up every day for a year, and there's a position that opens up, apply for it. You're not going to need a resume. Why? Because they've seen you work for the last year. <laughs> and so you know, each time that's happened, I've gotten three jobs in the last one. Currently, currently now, so it takes time, but 
everyone says volunteer it works and it, volunteering can pan out so that so if you are looking for work and you're disabled volunteer and you know use that kind of format and good luck with it because i've had i've had success with that um i um i the telehealth is great um it also has its negatives I, i've been one job i was tele working due to the ada uh, under the uh Oh, uh, the APA, where I, my job was letting me work home because of my disability. Well, I started that in 2012 and working home alone is great. But, you know, if, if you're not getting out of your apartment, <laughs> that could be that that could be bad. And um, so I've, I've become a little bit more um, if I don't have a sense of where I'm going or what to do or know where to go, I stay home. Not that I'm bored, I'm never bored, but but if, if there's no social interaction, it, it, the more and more you keep up doing that, the harder and harder it gets. <laughs> so you gotta make sure that you, you know, keep getting, making yourself active, get active, get out the door. Because if you don't, it's just gonna make it harder in, in the long run. Thank you for that. I have, there is a question in the chat I wanted to um, share with you, Stephen. Um, what did you address first, your HIV diagnosis or your bipolar uh, diagnosis? And, and also, did you seek counseling? And, and what were the struggles with addressing those concerns, if any? Um, uh, uh, it, the HIV care, of course, right, right away, I need, need to be able to uh, deal, take the medication to sort of stay healthy. Um, in the early days for counseling, uh, prior to um, Obamacare, um, it, was, it wasn't what it is today. I, you know, it was literally bouncing around between agency to agency because it was like 26 weeks of care here. And once you put in those 26 weeks there, you can no longer go there. <laughs> so 26 there, 26 way. So it's a lot of bouncing around, but um, so the HIV, obviously the physical part first, because it's important, you need to be able to function, breathe, eat. <laughs> um, and then the behavioral part is, you know, there are a lot of wait lists for behavioral health, even now, even with the new services. So just, you know, do your best to, they're out there. There's a couple of, um, I'll use the word, they, they use it on social media, queer, queer mental health. There's a large queer mental health on social media and it's like an on thing, what's going on? Where can I go? Who can help me? And people for find services. So I'd like to say now it's easy, not easy to find help, but there's more more availability to getting, you know, hands-on stuff. So, so it's HIV first and behavioral health second. Yeah, it's interesting, you, you know, you brought up um, telehealth, particularly for behavioral health services. I mean, the the lack of um, physical space restrictions that have opened up, at least for Cal and Lord, um, because we are now, I would say our behavioral health practice is over 80% virtual. Um, and so that has enabled us to hire so many more behavioral health providers and and expand the program exponentially since the, since the beginning of COVID. And it's still not enough. Um, there is such demand for behavioral health services for the LGBTQ community, um, and so it's it's you know vitally important. I think you know it's it's both and it is both the the physical and the mental well being um, that needs to be addressed uh, for everyone. Well, but, you know, certainly for this community, I think you know it has disproportionate um, need. I'll I'll just add other resources. A great the National Association of Mental Illness. Uh, has chapters all over the United States, almost in every county, and um, they're they're LGBTQ com compliant. Um, uh, again, we wrote policy back in the day. Um, if you can't get into a licensed therapist, you can go into a, a support group, a NAMI, <laughs> be around your peers. You know, as as a, a way to start to address it. Um, so you know, definitely look into those other services other than clinics because they they are out there. Um, and you know, that's part of it. That's, that's how, like, again, you just gotta sit down you gotta piece it out, do your research, do your homework. If you can't get a doctor, find a peer service, <laughs> find a community service that, that, that other people identify <laughs> or, you know, almost, you know, like, um, like an event bike group that's high, I'm, I'm a person of 40 living with, with bipolar. When do you meet? Like a meetup, things like that. That, that's not clinical help, but it's definitely help. <laughs> so they're out there. Be, resor be resourceful. Yeah, that's a, a really important strategy that we have used. And, you know, this was 
of course, pre-COVID, we had a much more robust programming for this. Um, but we started a um, kind of an educational series for patients. It was led by RNs. Um, you might remember this, Stephen. We had like an HIV 101, a diabetes 101. We had like nutrition counseling, and it was a series of, of like classes um, that we would have dinner and we would bring in guest speakers for our patients. And the real idea specifically to the HIV 101 was to encourage patients that had been living with HIV for many years to attend as well as newly diagnosed patients to build some peer support um, and to also of course provide education. And then at the end, you know, you get a certificate that you went through this course um, and learned more about HIV or diabetes um, uh, at the time. And, and it was really well attended and it was, for me, the sense of community and, and socialization was the top priority. I mean, it was great that we were able to provide this education as well, but it was really about bringing patients together in a way that they could find some support. And so we're just now ramping those back up. In fact, just this week, Stephen um, supported us around a nutrition um, a class that we did in partnership with um, a peer organization around the corner. Um, and that was, it's really, really fantastic. Um, Stephen, I don't know if you want to share about that. Yeah, that was, um, so it was part of the uh, peer program. And um, we did a, co a collaboration with uh, Hudson Guild, which is a large uh, public housing system network in, in Chelsea neighborhood of, of New York City. And it was great. You know, we, we went in there with part, part of our group, which, which is the aging HIV aging pop, population, my peers. And then just regular residents who are aging at the at the center there, you have to be like, I think 62 or 55 in order to take, take part in those meal programs and so forth. And we we advertised and it, it was just a great experience. It was a nice time to just, I think about, about 12 people or so showed up. They um, uh, we did a, we did a cooking demo. One of our um, nurses on a, we did a, did the nurse. One of our nurses is a, I don't know if she's a qualified chef, but she's good at it. And, and it was just a good fun time. And it was nice to go out and engage with people and hear their stories. You know, and yeah, I like that part. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's the best part. I will tell you. So our our um, longtime director of nursing, now our managing director of quality, um, who Stephen just referred to, used to be a chef in a prior prior life and became a nurse um, as a second career. Um, so yes, she is quite a, a good chef and, a, and um, has had a lot of experience and usually leads a lot of our nutrition and counseling. She's of course very passionate about it. Um, I do see we have a couple of questions in the chat for you, Stephen. Um, I'll start with, um, when you were first receiving care for HIV and bipolar, what did your medical providers do to make you feel more comfortable seeing them? Um, well, it was in New York City, you know, so I was bouncing around, but I, I felt comfortable. I, I you know, um, a lot of what we were seeing is um, I would walk into a facility and I obviously looking for gay friendly material. So if I saw something like a rainbow flag or if I saw something like one of the local papers and, and I felt okay, you know, <laughs> then I, and I was in a good spot, but most, so I never felt my HIV care has always been be it Fenway Community Health be it Fenway up in Boston or, or Cal and Lord. I don't know what it's like not to be in that environment. <laughs> so I've always been in a friendly environment open to HIV and, and the mental health portion of it. Okay, I have another a second question for you. What motivated you to stay sober and continue to live a happier lifestyle? Um, well, I'm, I'm back in it sober the last time, not quit going with it eight years plus from a crystal meth addiction. Not easy. Um, and um, just each day is, you know, doing all this community work, volunteering, helping them at the clinic. Um, uh, that that part and being able to do the volunteer work at the I live in public housing, do, working, volunteering amongst my my neighbors and my friends down there. Um, you know, they all, everyone's got a story. Even even my residents have uh, their own children that deal with addiction issues. And so when they see me I'm, and it's like, you know, I'm inspiring them. So it's just a culmination of just, you know, one step at a time working towards it. And, and then once you're in it, just I'm happy I'm here. I mean, I just I can't I can't 
say, you know, I don't know how else to express it. I'm just happy that I'm clean and I'm sober. Um, yep. Thank you. Um, I want to I, I kind of go back a little bit to talk about care for older adults because it's something that I'm personally really passionate about. It's something that I think um, almost every health center uh, that, I, that I've spoken with is also aiming to really build more robust programming. Um, I'll share a quick anecdote for my own personal experience. Um, at the, during COVID, at the beginning of COVID, when vaccines first became available um, to us in New York City, I um, built out kind of a, in collaboration with Lara, our managing director of quality, a vaccination program. Um, and at that time, there were very um, st strict restrictions on who was eligible for vaccination who was being prioritized for vaccination when they started by age. And so we opened up our vaccine clinic. The first patients to, to be able to access vaccine needed to be 75 or older, if I remember correctly. And so for the first time in my experience at Callum Lord, every waiting room was just filled with people that were not filled because we had you know, our, our space um, restrictions um, and we didn't you know, want to do social distancing. But everyone in the building was 75 and older. And I was meeting with a patient um, and he was in his eighties and he said, I love this. For the first time, I feel like this center is for me. Um, where do you see a waiting room full of people around my age? The whole center is filled with people around my age. Um, it's just, it was really exciting. It was also like, he felt he's getting vaccinated so he could leave his apartment for the first time in almost a year. Um, and so it was just a really exciting time. And it really inspired me to think about, you know, when older patients are walking into the health center, do they feel reflected in those around them, uh, in the you know digital signage, in the people behind the front desk, in the same way that we have really tried to ensure that, you know, every LGBTQ identified patient that walks in the door is feeling seen and, and heard, you know, what about older adults within the LGBTQ community? Are we doing as good of a job in, in achieving that? And I think the answer was no. And Stephen, you know, was part of the, the, the patient voices that really shared, like, these are the kinds of initiatives that we want to see increased or improved within the health center. Um, and so we've recently uh, hired through a generous grant with a private funder, um, a new position called the clinical director for elder care. Um, we're also, Stephen is, you know, supports us around a grant that we received uh, for um, people over the age of 50 living with HIV that has like specific navigation programs, peer support, um, and kind of like a, a really robust, distinct care team of people that are specially trained and experienced in working with older adults living with HIV. We hope to use this to expand the model to of course, everyone that is um, an LGBTQ identified person um, over 50 that are just accessing services. So, you know, we wanna have specialized services for people living with HIV, but we wanna have specialized services for all older adults that are accessing care with us. So we're trying to build a really robust model, of course, in collaboration with community partners like SAGE here in New York. But as Stephen was mentioning earlier, you know, SAGE is, is, can't be the only game in town. There's not enough resources there. I think every health center needs to be a space where, where older adults can access, you know, targeted services. Um, there's recently, um, for those FQHCs joining today, um, it's a, a notice of funding award from HRSA uh, specific to uh, expanding access to geriatric care within FQHCs. Um, that is really exciting to see an infusion of funding to help support these services. Um, a component of that is focus, is meant to be focused on um, teaching health centers and really building more um, uh, access to geriatric uh, specialty care in health centers um, across the country. So if you've not seen that um, uh, HRSA notification, I encourage you to, to take a look at it because, you know, as Stephen was saying, there's a lot of work to be done in, in building increased access to competent care for older adults 
specifically in the LGBTQ community that experiences those healthcare disparities, but I think writ large uh, across the country. Um, Stephen, do you wanna talk a little bit about the CAB alumni program and your experience with our older adult programming? I just wanted to add quickly what you said there, but there are there are a lot of other um, housing uh, complexes with with see activity centers all over the country. I think there's 1,100 in Manhattan alone, and they all have the same pretty much pretty much the same model: meal service, programming, activities. And so, for me, when I got involved with other ones, is they're always looking for people to program. You know, you know, I got programming to do. What am I going to do in this slot? What, who can I put there? Well, if you have something to let you like to do, for instance, I like flower arranging. I'll go over there and do that. And and that's just one way. I I I light up as a person. My whole anxiety goes away when I'm in front of the room teaching. <laughs> so so that's just one idea. If you got an idea and and you know, bring it into another facility. And, and if you're LGBT, let them know. You know, and you know. You know it works. It does work. It's, you know, they're out there. Um, your question about the community advisory board. Um, I, I I got involved with the community advisory board again through community service. Um, we put in uh, four years, and there's a after a certain amount of time, you have to take time off. And um, in 2019, when I was the chair, I said, "Well, I don't want to take time off." <laughs> so we implemented and put in place what we call the alumni. Um, and alumni are just what it is. You, you you graduated from an institution and you want to stay connected. And you, we stay connected within the communities, community work that we stay active with. We don't we don't vote. We don't do anything. We just go to these monthly meetings and we give our input. And just that alone, you know, it's, it's helping me stay connected. Um, that was why I did it. So there, there's a lot out there that you that you could do um, to stay connected. Um, one group. Um, out west, you know, listening to a similar talk about aging and staying connected was, hey, if you have friends out there, and you know, reach out to them. I haven't heard from you in a while. You know what? I'm I'm, I'm aging alone. Things aren't going that well. You know, let's talk boundaries. It would really help to me if I could talk to you once a month. Can I? And then get five or six people calling you regularly once a month. That's six people, and those calls are going to just give you hope to live. Hope to wake up. <laughs> and so, but that takes effort. Reach out to your friends. They all, the ones that knows what's going on. And, you know, they know you're disabled. You know, you're living with HIV, you know, think different things. And yeah, so just reach out. Try to try to reestablish connections is, is what I'm trying to say. And, and it helps. Thank you, uh, uh, Stephen and Anthony. We have someone who would like to ask a question verbally. And after that, I have a question for Steven and Anthony. So, so uh, I think that the line has been unmuted. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Stephen. This is Bob Burns from the National Center for Health and Public Housing. And, and thanks for being here today. And I appreciated what you said earlier about the importance of housing. And I'm just curious about what your experience was dealing with your local housing authority and what you see, I guess, as either needs or best practices uh, around housing to make sure that those folks with uh, with HIV and, and other health issues have the housing that they need. As, as you mentioned, it, it's so critical uh, when, when dealing with a health issue to make sure that the housing security is solid. So, So please go ahead. Um, I got into housing and I stayed local where I grew up because the model is where if you if you if your housing within, if you live in the same town with the housing you you get priority so I got priority and I even priority was just almost a year <laughs> um, yeah. but once once I was in um, it, you know it, it was not it was great and uh, uh, you know you, you adjust you open up a door and this is going to be your home for the next so you until you die <laughs> and. Um, did you go through the, you know, the the HOPWA program, or did you just go in as a, a just a, an applicant for housing, or how'd you do it? Yeah, I just went in through an applicant through housing through through, through a local town through through, through HUD and applying that way through and through the town of Cliffside Park where I live. And so, do you think in that area in general the housing needs are being met, or is is there is there room for improvement? I'm sure there's room for improvement. I I know. Our, our facility here just took on eight, 18 more new units 
not even across the street where, where I'm from. And they're now opening it up to 18 new families here, which is which is great. So I know they're wherever something comes about, they're always looking to buy it up or make it into housing. I don't know how they do it, where they get the money from, but they do a good job here. <laughs> I'm happy with it. All right, that that's that that that's great to hear. And and another issue that you you know both uh, Anthony and Stephen mentioned was social isolation, and so and I and I know you were touching on that. And I'm just wondering either you know if either of you want to speak on I, I guess initiatives to improve the situation. Um, you know, it, it it impacts people with HIV. It impacts people who are disabled. It impacts elderly. And of course, it impacts you know somebody who's got a little bit of all those things going on. Um, so, and again, I, I guess I'm looking for what's what's working, what's not, and maybe what what needs to be done. Um, I could pick up on. I'm involved with the with the grant that we got at, the, at the peer at the clinic and from the AIDS Institute, and and my job is is the monthly gatherings and we do two social groups and then we do one educational component so there's three a month going on and it's bringing in the the candidates that signed up for the program and to address that particular issue and um and we either have an educational component might be talking about food might be talking about nutrition might be talking about diabetes kidney function all kinds of different we get it and then we just socialize hang out what's going on and listen to each other's stories. And so that's, I have to say that's going well. You know, it's a, it's a new project. So obviously we're going to see it blossom. Um, on a housing section where I live, it's, it's, um, it's addressed. I mean, they, they do a good job. I'm, I'm not gonna, I'd like to say they do a good job at all the centers that are out there. But I, and I, if the, you may have, I, I said it earlier, is it, it takes, you got, you got to make, you got to participate to make it work. Mm -hmm. you know, if you want something to happen and where you're living, Participate. Don't just wait. What, what? Nothing's happening to you. Make it happen. You know. You can always ask. Hey, can we do this? And they're either going to say yes or no. If they say yes, great. And so I think it's just takes. You know, being able to. I I know it sounds easy. Just go ask a question. But um, it that's really what you know. They do a good job. And if and if I see something I want, I ask and I, I do my best to make it happen. Hope that answered your question. You know that, that was great, and and Anthony, from your side, um, how are you guys actively, you know, making sure that patients aren't suffering from some kind of isolation and, and taking steps to to address it? Yeah, I mean, this was certainly a, a major concern during COVID, um, and as you can see, we have a wonderful asset at Callum Lord and Stephen in giving us ideas for how to how to make things happen. Um, but you know, I will also say there is a real increased push, and it's coming from the clinicians, interestingly, um, particularly from our nursing staff, about doing more home care access and more home care support and really kind of bringing services to patients. Um, and this is something we're really looking into expanding, particularly around behavioral health. I mean, I think the telehealth does help um, kind of bring us into the home, but we are looking at other opportunities to expand. You know, even during COVID, we, you know, Laura and I, in fact, did um, kind of loaded up our backpacks with COVID vaccines to do home visits, home vaccination programming. Um, here in the city. And so I think there are different initiatives around that to try to tackle um, isolation, you know, certainly food deliveries, um, you know, organizations like God's Help We Deliver here in the city that do a great job with that. Um, but, you know, lastly, I, I will just also say, I think creating, it is as multifaceted a problem as there are different kinds of people and different needs. And so I think it's kind of doing the stuff that Stephen's talking about and creating partnerships, you know, with Hudson Guild to do a nutrition class and, and creating um, opportunities that way. It's the home care, it's this the HIV and aging grant that has patient navigators who are calling patients um, on a routine basis to just check in and, and have that touch point. So I think it's, it's many different strategies to address a, a really multifaceted issue. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Bob, for the questions. Uh, just a quick question to uh, for Stephen and, and you, Anthony. Uh, I would like to hear first from Stephen and then from you, Anthony. Um, one of the goals of the uh, ending the HIV epidemic is to increase screening, HIV screening. And I want to ask Stephen, uh, 
when you were uh, diagnosed with HIV, what were your fear, what, what your uh, fears were, and um, either a stigma or, you, or discrimination? And uh, then, uh, Anthony, uh, I would like to ask you what Colin Law is offering, how how you guys are addressing those issues or those fears for people for people who are newly diagnosed with HIV. Well, I um I came out as a gay man when I was in college in the 70s. So I was I, I didn't catch HIV until the 90s. So I happened to stay was able to, how I did that I don't know, but I did it. <laughs> um and um focus on the question. I'm sorry I get distracted. <laughs> uh what fears you you had when you were oh, first here, here, fears. Okay, so initially I was just I was sort of hit with shock. I mean, I, I lost my job. I, I went on disability. I was out of work for 54 days before I can physically like get myself into some frame frame of mind where I could function. And um back then it was Boston and I went into an organization similar to GMHC, it's called Boston Living Center. And um they got me back back into school, you know, back into educational, feeling confident. And um, so that took time. So have, having that available to me was a really big plus to help make it get me going. Thank you. And, and Anthony, you have a lot of experience uh, uh, working with the LGBTQI community. And what what they say what fears uh, i mean we've been talking about stigma discrimination and uh and how you help them to address these uh concerns yeah i mean i feel like this could be an entire other webinar but i will try to answer very briefly <laughs> you know i i think it really is i i you know i will speak for myself and in testing can be very scary and there's a lot of stigma um, around it. And so we really focused on training for our testers, our counselors and testers, um, to ensure that it is, you know, a routine screening. It is kind of a, it's an opt out kind of a model where we want to really want to decrease the stigma of, of screening by making it a routine part of primary care. And this is not just specific to HIV, it's about substance use assessment and screening. It's about depression assessment and screening during routine visits. Because the more this becomes a regular part of primary care that the nurse is gonna ask you when you come and sit in an exam room, the, the less stigmatizing it becomes that you feel like, oh, you're offering me an HIV test because you think that I am more at risk. You're offering, you know, you're asking me about substance use because you, you are, you know, it, it just kind of, takes all of that away when you you know make these standardized screenings and conversations but you've got to provide the training and support for your staff to be able to hold those conversations and then of course for patients that screen positive for any of the above, any of the above frankly you need to have a robust support in the moment um, and expertise in the moment we use a, a rapid treatment model um, at Cal and Lord so if someone tests positive in clinic they are meeting with a registered nurse getting a full assessment, um, getting connected to ARVs in that visit, like within the hour of, of sitting down, if you know they are ready for it, but really having that expertise within our nursing staff to provide that counseling, answer questions, and generate a supportive environment for patients to feel comfortable to engage in care is really the key. So it's kind of all about education and training in my mind. Thank you so much. And we are almost at the top of the hour. Uh, just a quick reminder uh, for those uh, who are with us, uh, please complete the post uh, uh, webinar survey. And uh, I would like to thank Anthony and Stephen for uh, this wonderful Q&A session. And uh, thank you, Stephen, for sharing your experience. Uh, is really uh, important to hear from those who are um, users of uh, the health center clinics. And uh, um, Anthony, your expertise is always, always appreciated. Uh, so if you have any questions or if you forgot your question and you would like to follow up, you can send your questions to any of the NCHPH uh, staff members. And uh, we will, uh, we are going to make sure that Stephen and Anthony uh, get your question and your question will be answered. And so um, once again, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, Anthony and Stephen, thank you, thank you and have a great, great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take have care. Bye-bye.